and welcome to another special edition of Adam versus the Man. The Coronaphobia Libertarian Presidential Party Debate Series continues today. I am joined by none other than Serene Ardellianu, and she is joining us to tell us about her campaign. I gotta say, I love your backdrop, Serene. And for those of you who don't know, yes, this is a debate series where Adam is gonna destroy the competition. But as you know, if you've been watching this, the reality is that we're having friendly conversations and we really are running as a team. Although as we come into the home stretch, things are, get, things are getting a little fuzzy. Things are getting a little squishy in the era of coronaphobia in general, but I'm very grateful to be joined by Serene today. I have seen her around the campaign trail making uh, a, a, a more of an effort than, than most of the candidates that we've seen in this race so far. And I'm so glad that her voice has been a card, part of this conversation. Um, some people, and, and I, I want to give her a chance to respond to this, some people have described her as the Marianne Williamson of the Libertarian Party, and I think that's an awesome title. And there are definitely some things that I appreciate about Serene's message in bringing a greater uh, spiritual and, 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 and humane, compassionate awareness to our message to the Libertarian Party. So Serene, before we get into your platform, your ideology, and where we find ourselves with the race right now. If you would please tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you coming to? Uh, where are you coming to us from today, virtually? And and how did you become a libertarian? Sure. So I am coming to you from San Francisco, which has been my home for about thirty years now, uh, which says a lot about me. <laughs> and uh, what made me become a libertarian was um, my parents, my upbringing. You know, they never called it that, but my parents were both immigrants from communist countries who came to America for freedom, for pursuit of the American dream, you know, risking their lives, my father more than my mother, by literally running across the border and risking getting shot. And so I was raised with certain values that I didn't realize until I actually became serious and committed to running for president and looked at the platform and realized, you know, this is it. I knew in the back of my head that I was aligned with a libertarian platform for several years. I had voted libertarian before, not necessarily consistently, but I also have changed over the years as far as my voting behavior goes and my activity level, obviously, in politics. <laughs> and so it's just um, really um, a natural evolution for me of just kind of realizing, you know, this is who I am. These are the values that I'm aligned with. This is what matters to me. This is what I believe I'm here to share and to master, and um, I surrender. Here I am. <laughs> Excellent. That's beautiful. No, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on here. It's like there's, there's, <laughs> the flies are just attacking me just to try me <laughs> while I'm talking to you. Um, no, you know, it's funny. I, I, I hadn't realized that uh, th that we had that in common. I was born in San Francisco and, and raised in the Bay Area, so I, I certainly have an appreciation of that unique spirit of the West. So, you know, and, and so my parents, I, I think, gave me that too, as an anti-authoritarian background without the specifics that I had to figure out for myself. So to, to, to nail down here, you know, where you are ideologically now, would you call yourself, well, what does it mean to be a libertarian philosophically? Would you call yourself a voluntarist? Any other specific labels apply that, that, that you know, and I'm not saying we, we need labels, we need, we need to label everybody, but, you know, the, the labels are helpful, obviously, in understanding, you know, where we're coming from ideologically. Yeah, well, you no, know, and actually, that's a great conversation in and of itself, but, you know, because labels just give us, um, you know, an idea but it's not concrete, you know, labels do limit us because I believe that we are fluid beings, myself included, and I've never liked labels, but for the sake of answering your question, uh, <laughs> you know, I believe that I am, I, I want to believe this, right, we talked about this before, is that I am really encompassing the platform that, you know, I am a pure libertarian, but I'm guessing there's a lot of people that believe that and that we don't all show up in the world the same way. So for me, really what it means to be libertarian is to have the freedom to be your most authentic self, to do whatever fulfills you, to feel safe enough to pursue that because you live in a world where others encourage you to be your most authentic self and you mind your own business. You let others have the same freedom to also be their most authentic self as long as nobody is doing anything to intentionally harm others. You know, it, it's really about, you know, we all have our unique purpose or paths in life and gifts in life 
And if we don't have the ability to become aware of what they are and develop what they are, not only do we shortchange ourselves, but we shortchange the collective. And so I believe that if we have a government that encourages freedom in every possible way of the word, you know, and, and a society that embraces that freedom that government encourages, that we would live in a much more harmonious and prosperous world versus right now, um, you know, we do have these labels that divide us and create confusion. You know, there's a lot of um, talk about political correctness, and I believe that's also part of the problem. And, and, you know, and so I believe the Libertarian Party agrees with me that we don't get hung up on political correctness or labels. We just want to do ultimately what benefits everybody and not just ourselves. And we realize that when we do what benefits the all, it also benefits the individual. You know, but again, it's not about forcing our will. It's about voluntary letting people find themselves and, and doing what feels right to them and not forcing them to subscribe to a set of beliefs or to certain regulations or taxes, you know, lifestyles. Everybody deserves to figure out what's right for themselves. And, and that's what libertarianism is about for me and why it's so important for me to spread the values of libertarianism. So you're running for president of the United States, not just for the Libertarian Party nomination. And you've probably heard me say that you, know, you have to be some kind of psychopath to want to be president of the United States, right? To wield this, this unjust power over other human beings that fundamentally shouldn't exist, that, that no human being should have. And I think just talking about this is attracting flies. Just talking about power <laughs> is making the flies swarm me this morning. And... Uh, yeah, so you know, I, I've I've said that like even even as a benign dictator to say that I can wield this power over other human beings, I can put on the ring of power and not be corrupted by it. Like that's you know, how do you exempt yourself from that in policy? If 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 for me as a libertarian, not not just as a as a libertarian party member, as a delegate, you know, who, who you're asking for my vote. Uh, for, for the nomination, but as, as, a, <clears throat> as a libertarian in the general public, you're asking for my vote. And I'm saying, well, how can you prove to me with what you're actually going to do if we hand you the ring of power that, that you're not going to put it on, that you're not going to engage in this fantasy of, well, I'm going to be a kinder, gentler tyrant? Well, I believe actions speak a lot louder than words. And so I've been doing my best to be completely transparent and showing my most authentic self publicly throughout my campaign and in very unconventional ways because I realized getting into this, well, first of all, this isn't something I actually wanted to do initially. This is something I actually resisted doing and I thought doing. I was hoping somebody like Marianne Williamson would be the one. And I just didn't see anybody else running for office that, has spent as much time as I have figuring out life, learning how to master their emotions, learning how to reason correctly, learning how to love all because they truly believe and understand that we're all connected and that everything that I do affects everybody else, right? So this hasn't been a choice. This has, had, like I said, this has been a surrendering for me because I have felt called to do this for a long time. I don't want power because I believe in non-interference, not just non-aggression. I don't believe that any individual has the right to interfere in anybody else's life, right? Unless, of course, there's some kind of act of violence going on to protect somebody, right? That, that, you know, that we let people do whatever they do. And so for me, this is about leading by example. This is about planting seeds, about empowering others. Because what I've realized is that our current system, whether it was intentional or not, enslaves the American people. You know, I believe that most people in government want to do the right thing, but unfortunately, they are not reasoning correctly. They're driven by their emotions. You know, we have a lot of great ideas, but there's no substance behind them, right? And so for me, I'm trying to give people their power back. For example, um, you know, one of my volunteers asked me to start recording some of my written words and turning them into videos. And the first one that I made public, it's called, I Believe in You. You know, and it's about the things that you can do and that you can do more than you give yourself credit for. So I am working on lifting people up because I realize that there are a lot of people in politics that make promises they don't keep. There's been a lack of accountability. And so I'm showing people this is who I am. This is how I show up in the world. I've been doing work nonprofit for about the past decade, and I've been doing a lot of it publicly so people can see that I've created programs 
to help people um, across the world, collaborating with famous experts from around the world in neuroscience, epigenetics, um, reprogramming the body and the mind. You know, I've been doing this for years. I've been writing articles. It's not like I just showed up out of the blue and like, this is who I am. You have to believe me. No, look me up and see what I've been doing and see what others have to say because this has been a journey. And now I admit, I'm not perfect. No human being is. So when I say like, yes, I've invested all this time, I think there's people that have actually invested more time in figuring out life than I have. And I was struggling understanding why aren't they running for office? I think they have all the answers. They should run. But then I realized, you know what? Maybe they have a different path and they're doing it already. And because I feel called, I have to do this and show people a different way of politics, a different way of government where we get government out of people's lives. We build people up because unfortunately what I realized is that a lot of people right now don't believe in a better way. They've lost hope. And so we have to help them. We can't just throw this on them and expect them to be able to thrive if they've been barely surviving for a long time. We have to help people. You know, no matter what happens to us, whether you and I win the nomination, whether we win the election, we still have to play our part to bring people up with us so that they can handle a libertarian president. Absolutely. Now, there's there's a lot in there, and I want to go back <laughs> to what you bring. And I, I don't, <coughs> excuse me. I don't, th this is one of those things. I'm I'm actually I'm really excited by a lot of what you're saying and what it means for the evolution of the libertarian message, the the, the spiritual and emotional and and self-actualization side of libertarianism. We're definitely going to come back to that, and we're going to come back to Marianne Williamson. But I, I wanted to, and, and, and your reputation here as well, but I, I wanted to, to really drill down on this because I didn't hear from you specific policy. And this, this is what I want to challenge you on. You know, it's, it's easy to say, I'm a voluntarist, I'm a libertarian, I'm a spiritually aware, conscious, ethical person, and that's why you should make me president and give me the ring of power. What I have done, and, and, and so just to, to give you some examples in contrast, like myself, I have said peaceful, orderly, responsible bankruptcy process. My policy agency by agency is crystal clear. There's no subjectivity in this. You, you know exactly what's gonna happen when Kokesh is elected for president. With Dan Berman and, excuse me, Dan Taxation and Steph Berman and Arvind Vorha, you know, what they have said is that they are essentially going to transition the federal government into a voluntary institution by using the pardon power to say we're going to pardon everybody we possibly can for victimless crimes. Is that something that you would do? And, and for all those things, those great things that you said in, in background, how do you manifest those in policy? How do you change this into a specific offer for the American people as president? I'm going to do this. And don't give me the, don't give me the political answer. Well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And I, give me the answer. This is how as a libertarian, I'm going to fundamentally change things. Yeah. And by the way, like, you know, when I've been in debates and stuff like that, a lot of times I don't repeat the things that have been said because I agree with them. I am a libertarian and those things that you said I agree with. And those are things that I have thought about. And so um, my strategy, for example, because I want to get rid of as many regulations as makes sense, right? Get rid of government entities, let the free market step up. And so uh, what I've talked about is, you know, my first hundred days in office, you know, there's two things that I'm really going to focus on. And one of them addresses what you just asked which is I am going to make an open invitation to the general public to come up with solutions to replace things that the government is currently doing to bring it into the private sector. And the reason I want to give people 100 days is because I want to be respectful to people because I understand that we have a system right now that many people have been become dependent on, and we can't just take it away from them. It's going to shock people. It's going to shock the system. It could be very detrimental. Yes, I would love to just flip a switch and magically overnight there's no taxes, no regulations, right? No victimless crimes. You know, I do criminal justice reform work. I work with exonerees. You know, I, I know all about things that are happening that are not okay in our system. And so these are things that are near and dear to me. And, you know, we shouldn't be prosecuting or charging people for drug possession or drug usage. You know, that's one part of my platform is let's decriminalize it all. Let's understand that the reason that people do drugs especially people who have um, abuse, is because there is something inside of them that is hurting, right? They're either, they either don't want to feel pain or they, they, want, they don't want to feel numb, right? They're, this is an effect. 
we're not addressing the causes. We, we talked about this in a debate, you know, with gun control. It's the same thing. I am about addressing the causes of the undesirable behaviors in our society, not about addressing the effects. And so I believe it's really important to bring people in, not say that the government knows best and what's right. Let's have a conversation. Let's look at ideas because I believe the public is very capable to come up with more efficient systems that are fairer, that are more transparent, that are more affordable for the public than the government. And so that's a big part of it. I, I hope I answered the question, but really it's about giving it to the public and letting them decide. You know, I'm very uh, big on improving health care because of my own challenges, being disabled in and out of ER several times a year in the past. You know, I have very severe PTSD, um, you know, questioning why I was here. I, you know, it has not been a straight line. You know, my, my personal evolution, I had to hit bottom to wake up and then I had to slowly take apart my own patterns. And so my own journey has helped me realize what other people are going through and how this has to happen as well. And realizing that, you know, again, even though we want the ideal over here, it's not going to happen overnight. Even if we have great plans and we start implementing, we have to be realistic that in the execution might not be perfect, but we have to realize that if we stay focused and we're not committed to um, our egos, <laughs> but we're committed to doing what's right, that we will get there. And, you know, having conversations like this are very beneficial. For example, I've made it public that if I get the nomination from the Libertarian Party, I'm going to invite you. I'm going to invite other candidates to work with me because this isn't about me. I don't want to be king, you know. <laughs> I just want to help free people. I don't need the credit. I don't care. I'm complete. I want others to feel what I feel, and I believe that I can provide it for them. But what is really necessary at this point is for people to realize that freedom, ultimately, it doesn't come from out there, right? If you're not free inside here, you're always going to be experiencing enslavement out there. And so that's part of what I talk to people about. It's like the government can give you all the freedom in the world. But freedom is a responsibility. If you don't know how to handle it, if you haven't made peace with yourself, with your emotions, with your life, you're going to feel trapped. And so we really need to help people understand this, that, you know, yes, it is really important who you vote for because they will set the tone. But there's also a part that we personally have to play in this. You know, we can't just expect government to wave a magic wand and I instantly feel free and everything is good in the world. No, you have to play your part. You know, you have to be willing to show up and give 100%. So I would never have uh, brought it up in this context because I, I, it would be, I think, inappropriate to ask personal medical questions. But since you brought it up, if, if you care to get into it more, I think that would be interesting personal background about why you have issues that lead you to the, R, the ER so frequently. And uh, if, 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 of course, I know as a, someone who's experienced PTSD myself from the combat experience in the Marines, you always have to say, hey, feel free to say, that's as much as I'm going to say. But yes, if you, if, if you would, you know, by way of personal background, let us know, you know, what, what you feel comfortable with in those two areas. Sure. And I, and I like being open about it because I know that I can help others by being open. And that's part of why I'm here, right? Because I've overcome something that many others are suffering from. So my PTSD, and I'll try to be as succinct as possible. People can ask me questions that they want after. I don't want to take too much time. But my PTSD essentially comes from um, daily um, early childhood abuse, basically from the time I was an infant to the time I was 14 when I ran away from home. So every day I was getting physically punished if I was not up to standards, and I was also being um, verbally abused, you know, psychologically. And so this is what I've overcome, right? But the thing is, is as an adult, until I started realizing that I had a pattern from childhood that I was repeating, I kept attracting abusive relationships in my life, professionally, personally, or romantically. And it wasn't because it's what I wanted. You know, I wanted to feel loved. I wanted to feel safe and secure and accepted. Familiarity. We all do, right? Seeking familiarity, <laughs> and, you know, right? Yeah. Right? But that was what I knew was that abuse and love go together. I had this incorrect program. And, and I love my mom. You know, I know that she meant the best for me, but she didn't know better. And that's why those of us who do know better have to stand up and teach others. But let's fast forward. So <laughs> as an adult, I was repeating this pattern. I was doing really well. I was selling exotic cars. I worked for Bentley, Lamborghini, Tesla. I co-owned a nightclub and an art gallery in San Francisco. 
on paper, I looked like I had it all. But I was miserable. Nobody for the majority in my life actually cared about me. Everybody that was in my life at that point, at that peak, for the most part, is not in my life today. And what that means is those people were resonating with who I was at the time, right? I was this person that had a lot of money, had a lot of connections, lived large, took care of everybody, right? They weren't my real friends. And so I had this realization because I hit bottom. I went through some traumatic experiences. I'm not going to go into all the details. I find some non-disclosures. Um, but I went through some serious stuff, okay? And I didn't want to be here. I felt like I had done it all. And that was when I woke up and realized I had this pattern, right? But the journey was, you know, um, with PTSD was getting triggered until I started to really heal myself. It was like everything was a trigger. And uh, PTSD is mostly psychosomatic, meaning it's, it's a functional disease. So I have a background in healthcare now. I'm a, a chiropractic dropout student as well. <laughs> but I realized there's only three causes of disease. And the majority is functional. It's either um, organic, meaning, um, you know, like you ate something that poisoned you, for example, structural, you know, like you broke a bone, or it's functional, it's self-created. You know, our feelings, our emotions create disease or they create health. And so I was creating disease. And it would get to the point where I had ulcers and spasms and I lost my voice. and I didn't feel safe in the world. And I went and saw all these different specialists, had x-rays, lab work, everything. And nobody could help me. And it wasn't until I actually started to be honest with myself. And, and I, I met a holistic doctor that helped look at me at the whole being, not just the symptom, right? And that's why I'm so big about let's look at causes, right? Addressing symptoms doesn't address the cause. It will just express itself in a different way, right? And so for me, it was in and out of the hospital because I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't honoring myself. I didn't really understand how to be healthy, I didn't understand that I was making myself sick by the things that I was listening to, the things I was reading, the things I was watching, the people I was hanging out with. When I made a shift, when I started to really understand how life works, and what I'm talking about is understanding natural laws, because, you know, I've talked about this in other places, um, you know, we're animals. And the same laws that apply to other animals apply to us. Yes, we have other abilities that other animals can't, you know, we're creators, we can create things out of, you know, ideas out of nothing, right? Um, we can go against instinct, but we're still animals. And when, we, and when we understand nature, for instance, ebbs and flows, we reap what we sow. When you start to understand these things, you start to be more intentional, at least for me, right? Because it becomes more painful to go against something when you know that it's right. <laughs> you can't unlearn something. So um, as I've been working more and getting clear on understanding life, I've been very stable and grounded and able to work through things that would trigger me in the past. And very serious, very serious things like potential loss of family members, right? There have been a few events in the past couple of years, or sorry, just even in the past year where there was potential that there were a couple family members, I didn't know if they were going to make it or not. But I was able to work through it very easily, be present. One of the things I did was I reminded myself, hey, Serene, you know you're going to be running for president. You know that you've been preparing for this. You know that you have to be a rock, that people come to you for support, you know that everything in life ebbs and flows. You know that this physical form is temporary and that what I am, what everybody else is, is, is the life inside of the body, right? And I'm sharing this because it's really important for us to start to think about what is life, right? Because we haven't agreed on it. And I hope it's okay that we're going kind of deep, but you asked me and I'm telling you what's worked for me. And it's really just getting very clear on understanding life, understanding myself, what drives my behavior, what drives others realizing that, you know, everything is relative. What you think is bad could actually be the greatest thing ever. What you think is good could be the worst thing ever. And we have to realize that we don't know everything. And if we just kind of go with the flow and watch it and not get attached to it and learn from everything, that we can recover and, and thrive and have a positive outlook in life. Beautiful. Now, you talked about your own uh, punditry and your, your own work and writing outside of this campaign, of course, as you know, this is my book. And I'm, the reason, like, I, I have some actual credentials in the realms of which you speak that I, I want to cite now just to, to tell you, you know, how much this is something that, that, that I, I genuinely am excited about because I think it's a, a critical part of the libertarian message as a whole. Now, I, I'm, you know, people say, are you a thick or thin libertarian? And I, I don't really, you know, like this 
differentiation, but it's, you know, the libertarian is thin. It's, it's just self-ownership. It's just the non-aggression principle. That is everything or versus, you know, thick libertarianism is no, it, it, it applies. It has all these other components to it. And I think the, the idea of libertarianism itself is this very simple, singular philosophical point. You know, we, we, it's not a political philosophy. It's an ethical philosophy that we apply to government, right? That we, or that we apply to politics. And, and, and as such, it has a lot more around it that is not libertarianism, but is related to libertarianism, right? So like just the idea of, of, of waking up to the nature of society, the world around us and, and our relationships with other human beings. Like if you go, well, libertarianism is just this. Well, why do we not have this, <laughs> right? You have to ask that question. And the way that you ask it of, you know, what are the root causes? What are the, what are the you know, systematic malfunctions or the, 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 the reprogramming that we can do to address these issues? And I think that, that along with all of this, th there is a huge underdeveloped body of thought, if you will, that is related to libertarianism that is not connected to it enough directly. And I think Marianne Williamson, uh, bless her heart, represents the, the worst of that disconnect, that she speaks to all these beautiful spiritual ideas, to self-realization, and yet then says, and therefore, we need a big welfare state to steal from all of us and redistribute wealth. And we should trust daddy government to organize the economy and, and have a kinder, gentler economic system forced on us by government. And you go, wait, 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 wait weren't you just, uh, it's like, you're the version of Marianne Williamson who makes sense. You're the version of Marianne Williamson who has a consistent, ethical, loving political philosophy to back up this beautiful spiritual self-actualization perspective. Now, the, the, help me out for a second here with the terminology, because I want to, I, I, I like to say that, that it's a, it's a spiritual and lifestyle awareness that goes hand in hand with libertarianism. Is that, is that you think a good way of characterizing kind of what you're talking about and uniquely trying to bring to the movement and the message? Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because I've been getting interviewed by people in the spiritual community lately. As a presidential candidate, they've been asking to bring politics to spirituality because they're realizing that you cannot avoid politics and be in this world and be spiritual. So it's been really inspiring to speak to these people and, and not to promote myself, but to share about my journey and why I got involved and why more people who are loving and driven to do what is best for everybody, not just themselves and their groups, should be getting into politics and public service and public leadership. You know, I, I, yes. I have to comment. Yes. <laughs> Hold on, I got, I got, I got to, to jump comment. in. Okay. Because, because this is, I, I bet if you spoke, I, I, I mean, one of, one of my new goals in life is to get Serene Ardellianu in front of every Marianne Williams supporter, uh, Williamson, mm -hmm. because, because if, <laughs> now for her, for, to, to look at Marianne Williamson herself, you go, okay, you have all these beautiful ideas. You, you, how did you not apply them consistently to politics? It's like she put all of this thought and effort into developing her spiritual consciousness and then turned to politics and goes, well, I'll do what the bleeding heart liberals in Hollywood are doing, more or less. Okay, you know, I'll, be a, I'll be a better version of that. And you know, I still appreciate how the, the, the love behind her message came out, but I would bet money that 90% of her supporters are going to have more consistent conscientiousness in their application of love and ethics than Marianne herself. Maybe I can get an interview with her now that she's not running for the Democratic Party nomination. We can, we can, maybe we'll make it a three-way, you, me, and her. Yeah. And we'll put her, we'll, we'll, we will embrace her and celebrate everything that she has done to raise spiritual awareness in this country and ruthlessly challenge her on her misapplication of that in the political realm. So what I was going to say is, you know, it's funny that you're bringing this up <laughs> because in the past 24 hours, somebody else has suggested that as well. And they're trying to make it happen. And I said, you know, I think that would be very interesting because I appreciate what she's done. 
And I, I don't believe in putting people down because I understand that everybody's, you know, a different part of their journey, right? But I believe that we can actually, and I'm not, and I don't try to convert people or anything. That's not my intention. But I believe that through an open dialogue with her, something similar like this, that she would probably also understand and recognize, you know, the, the shortcomings of the high aspirations that, that she had, right? Is that, you know, whenever I talk to somebody who is a Democrat or a Republican, if I get them to reason through, you know, why they're supporting something and, and point out the logical fallacies, it's very easy to get them to come around and realize, like, yeah, I have a point, you know, that maybe I'm right. You know, for example, I was at uh, one of my chiropractor's office this past weekend, and my chiropractor told a couple of his patients that I was running for president. And so they started talking to me. And they were asking what I thought about Bernie, for example. I said, you know, I... I, I I used to think he had good ideas, but then I went and saw him and I didn't see any substance and then I started paying attention to his campaign and I realized this is actually very dangerous what he's promoting, whether he's coming from good intentions or not. And I said, look at, and they said, what about free health care for all? I said, well, look at where you are right now. You are at a holistic doctor's office who doesn't take insurance, who has helped <laughs> you get better. You are paying out of your pocket to see this doctor. What Bernie and many others are promoting is the same system that we have right now that you are not using that isn't helping you. He's not encouraging you to see whoever you want. You know, he's not encouraging to pay those people, right? So, and, and from whose money? Anyway, that's another conversation. But they realize, oh, he's promoting the broken system. They said it themselves, right? It was just having, and it was a perfect setup because, Healthcare at a chiropractor's office, you know, so these things happen all the time, you know, but unfortunately people get caught up in the hype. Yeah, free healthcare, free education sounds great, but one size doesn't fit all and it isn't free. And I'm really adamant about, um, you know, taxes that if we are going to do taxes, they shouldn't be discriminated based on class, right? Stealing what some people say from the rich is just like stealing from the poor. It's still stealing. It doesn't and, and more, it okay. more, and, and more importantly, we know that even as a concept, taxing the rich doesn't work. T using the government to take money from the rich will not work because the rich are the ones who are able to control the government. And <laughs> any tax that is billed as, this is a progressive tax, ends up in application being primarily a regressive tax. And if you look at our system as a whole, it's set up so the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. And what we have is a tax on the middle class, the tax on the working class, where they use the poor as the excuse to steal from us to inevitably give to the rich. And they say, well, we're taking more from the rich proportionally. Yeah, well, you kind of cancel that out with all the corporate benefits and kickbacks and and all the ways that rich people can buy their way with accountants out of paying any meaningful taxes. So, yes, that's a great point. Now, Serene, I, I, I want, of course, yeah, lobbying, campaign donations, super PACs, all these things that they can do to manipulate the process. So uh, chapter nine of my book is called True Personal Freedom. And the first section there is emotional slavery. Section two is health freedom. And, and you know, that's just not so much, you know, it, it's definitely related, but it's almost distinct from the spiritual, philosophical realm that we, you know, or, or self, it, it's more in self-actualization, but it's, it's, it's even more sort of pedestrian than this. When it, like, if you're going to wake up as a libertarian and say, oh, yes, I embrace the non-aggression principle, I embrace ethics and a applying them consistently because I've decided I, I want to be a good person, right? And you go and you, you go apply this to government and you see all the evils of it. And then you go, well, geez, it's really messing with our health in, in countless ways. And when you just get, hey, maybe I shouldn't trust authority without question. <laughs> like you just get that part of it. You go, well, gee, yeah, I guess if the FDA sa says a drug is safe, that doesn't necessarily make it safe. If it says it's unsafe, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to save my life. Right. And, you know, I point out that thanks to the work of Dr. Mary Ruert, you know, we have an FDA that has killed over 40 million people just with its manipulation of the prescription drug process. True, ridiculous tragedy. But, you know, even with health freedom, even just being able to answer these questions for yourself rather than turning to what you know is a corrupt authority. And then section three, work freedom. 
and and this is getting more towards that self actualization at a deeper level of what I do with my my time and my effort every day and how I contribute to the, the productivity the value creation process for humanity has to be in line with my values I'm not going to work for government if I don't have to. I'm going to work under the table if I can so that I'm not working for government because the average working American today is working for government half the year when you add up all the costs of government. That's insane. So to opt out of that is, is really critical. But my favorite section, and, and I think the one that, that you would appreciate the most, is happiness causes freedom. There it is, yes. Happiness causes freedom. and. This is something that, that actually came to me from my experience in jail, where I did, I did four months and the first two months were in solitary, and I found myself happier than I had ever been. And it was by choice. It was because what I chose to embrace so powerfully about that situation was that I was there for a righteous reason in civil disobedience to be doing hard time in an American jail was, uh, you know, a, a pretty challenging experience, but it wasn't hard for me in the sense that I was able to maintain my emotional self mastery the entire time. And anytime a guard would come to my cell and they have to come pretty, you, have you done time serene? No, but one of my dear friends has been incarcerated for 13 years, uh, wrongfully Ooh. convicted. So, so we talk, so I hear about that. Well, if you've never done time yourself, <laughs> I would say, what kind of libertarian are you, Serene? But no. Uh, the, <laughs> I've uh, done different kind of time. <laughs> I'm a soldier so yeah. of love. <laughs> so uh, anytime a guard would come to my cell, and they, they have to for regular checks, and I, you know, I would say, hold on, can, can, I have to tell you something. And they would come up to the little, the little window slit in the door of my cell, and I would say, you're a free, beautiful, independent human being, and you should never let anyone tell you otherwise. And just every chance, that was my mantra in jail, and that helped me show the guards and show myself, hey, the physical reality is not as important. My emotional state is my choice. Your emotional state is your choice. And I am choosing to be happier than you. So step your game up. And, and you know, being able to engage and challenge people that way was, uh, you know, something that I really took with me from that experience. So, Serene, this is something that I truly value as part of my libertarian message or my, you know, message as a whole that I want to share with the world. So before my last question, though, what is it that you are going to be doing with or without the LP presidential nomination to increase the reach of your message in the libertarian movement in the world? And what can we do to help? Sure. So <laughs> I've, you know, already been doing it. I mean, basically a few years ago, I committed my life to improving the quality of life for all living beings. I realize that that's something I can do. And I realize that there's many different ways I can do it. This is, you know, running for president, being president is one way that was shown to me as the most effective and efficient way to do it. But I also realize even if I am president, the most I can do that for is eight years. And I still have, you know, I tell myself at least seven more decades of this work ahead of me. And so, you know, I talked about in the beginning of this about being authentic and that's what this journey has been about, is having the courage to be my most authentic self, to explore what are my natural gifts and inclinations, and to develop and share them more. And so that's what I'm going to keep doing, keep writing, keep talking to people, keep doing interviews, keep creating programs to educate people, keep standing up, you know, for the truth and helping lift others people up. Excuse me, helping lift others up. <laughs> Um, but really, it's just to keep being more me and to keep uniting people to keep and the courageous part is really a big important part of it. Because I'm assuming that other people go through it. I believe it takes a lot of courage to show up in the world this way, especially to be authentic and not be moved by what anybody else thinks, knowing that your heart is in the right place, 
and that you're doing what you believe is the right thing, but you're also open to reevaluating that, you know, based on feedback, right? Because I really want people to understand that I'm not fixed. Like I said before, I'm fluid, right? So I'm open to learning and adapting because everything in life changes, right? That's the only constant in life is change. And so trying to hold on to something that might not work for us anymore is not something I support. I am supportive of moving forward with people and serving however I can. And so that's really, you know, um, what I'm focused on in any capacity. As far as help goes, I'm really grateful. I have um, over a dozen volunteers right now. We just had a call last night. And really the, the greatest help I need is not money because I'm actually working on getting money out of politics. We don't need money to win or to make a positive impact in the world. Um, but it's in just spreading the message, you know, um, having people promote whatever they see or read or learn about me that resonates with them with others so more people have the chance to consider my ideas, you know, because what I'm creating right now, it's not just for this election, it's for humanity for as long as they're willing to entertain it. Because like I said, I told you, um, you know, the first video recording that just went live yesterday was just me talking about my belief in others. Or it's a positive message to support people. It's, it's my view on politics, but it's also something that is a gift for the world, no matter what happens, it's still valuable. You know, I want to only create things that are of value, that are timeless. That's beautiful. All right. So last question. You have a campaign ad. One minute. It's going to go in front of the entire American public. What do you say? Go. <laughs> uh, I am Serene Ardaliano, 2020 presidential candidate. I am a survivor and a thriver who will bring in love, logic, and liberty for all Americans and all human beings across the globe. I don't need a minute. <laughs> uh, all right. Beautiful. Finally, any, any last thoughts on your website, please? Sure. Um, just I want people to understand that I'm running for office because I truly love all people. You know, even if I don't like certain aspects of a person's personality, I still love them. I love the life in them. And so I want people to understand where I'm coming from that, you know, I don't take offense if somebody doesn't like me. I don't, and I don't get too attached if somebody does because I realize that this is all fleeting, but I'm coming from a place of love. And I believe that that's really the most important thing for all of us to master. My website is serene2020.com. That's S O R I N N E 2020.com. And I have, Tons of videos, interviews, debates, uh, written stuff on there that you can explore to get to know me. And also, just like I said, everything I do is to lift people up, to free people, to heal people. And so if you're just looking to raise your own vibration, tune in, you know, even if you don't want to vote, although I believe we should be voting. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us today, Serene. For those of you watching, thank you for joining us on Adam vs. The Man. You can support this production, of course, by going to patreon.com slash Adam vs. The Man. Thank you to all of our patrons who make this show possible. Thank you to Serene for joining us, of course, and everybody who has made this an incredible season for the Libertarian Party presidential primary. We have our convention, at least our online presidential nominating part of the convention, coming up it looks like it is going to happen on schedule on may 22nd so get involved be paying attention there's a lot happening online that you should be paying attention to there's way more than you could ever possibly be paying attention to that you should be but moderating our attention paying attention to that which matters directing our love and our attention and our energy towards that which is important to us is how we achieve a free society so if you're not getting our alerts, our subscription alerts, please join our email list, thefreedomline.com. This broadcast goes out on Facebook and Periscope and YouTube and everywhere else. Our wonderful producer, CJ, can put it. You can't trust any one of these platforms. You have to be an active and engaged consumer of media. Thank you for doing that and for making everything that we do possible. Peace and love, y'all.